All right, so I um, am going to start us off. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, Colin and I were sitting in a talk last year at NSCA. And we were sitting in the back, and there um, was some very interesting questions regarding creatine and supplements and how they shouldn't be used. And uh, we looked at each other and, and thought to ourselves that perhaps it would, it would be a good idea to provide some education. So we are researchers, um, but also work with athletes, and um, I was also a former athlete. So it comes from a different perspective on education on what you guys can do. Um, we're all in different settings, but uh, we both also work in the NCAA setting. So I'm in a Division I university, Division three. so kind of using some of those issues to make prescriptions on what to give your athletes and what to tell them to use. So to get started, um, first, talk. Well, what I'm going to talk about is introduce us, start us off with um, some basic guidelines on what to use as um, supplement choice and how we know, um, as most of you guys can agree, the supplement industry is not necessarily regulated. Um, but what we can do is educate our athletes and our coaches on um, what to look out for as far as buying a, a product that contains actually what it's supposed to contain. And then there's a very good position statement out through the ISSN uh, by Dr. Kreider, who's here with us um, at the conference. And it splits up and defines supplements um, according to some of the scientific findings. So based on apparently effective categories, um, possibly effective and not effective. So today, we're going to talk about the, the ingredients and supplements that fall in that possible or that apparently effective category and talk about what kind of creates that kind of a, identify how to cipher through the literature. So first regarding some of the NCAA guidelines. So I teach um, several athletes and, and undergrad students and the question always is is well are supplements banned? And I have several football players specifically that will be like well yeah they're banned. Um, we can't take supplements. A lot of the sports nutritionists say don't take supplements because, you know, it's hard to educate them. So what we want to do is kind of talk about um, there's a difference in what they can be provided uh, by the university, by strength coaches, athletic trainers, sports nutritionists, uh, and what's effective and what may be, you know, that may be beneficial for recovery and, and that sort of thing. So when we take a look here, this is a section of the bylaws from NCAA. Um, permissible to provide to athletes. We see vitamins and minerals, energy, energy bars, calorie replacement drinks, electrolyte replacement drinks. So I'm fortunate to, to work on an NCAA uh, Division I campus, and they have lots of resources. Fueling stations consist a lot of bars and recovery drinks, um, which we'll get into. So they can provide a lot of that. And then we take a step over here, not permissible to provide to athletes. So what I want to point out is if we look at a lot of these ingredients and supplements, when we take a closer look at the literature, a lot of them are coming out as, uh, as apparently effective and potentially beneficial for these athletes. So even though they can't be provided, it may be beneficial to educate our athletes on the effects that it may have um, and how it may improve performance. So um, we're going to talk about a handful of these and, and, and look at the literature and have time at the end to, to apply it. So first, one of the biggest certifications or things to look for, NSF certified product, um, it's a regulating body uh, that looks at what's really in a product or verifies the contents of the supplement. So actually, what's in the product matches the label. So this is a thing to point out to athletes and strength coaches that if you are going to purchase a supplement, you need to make sure that you know what's in it and what actually is on the label is what they're consuming. Um, they assure that there's no ingredients present in the supplement um, that's not disclosed on the label, and then also that there's no uh, unacceptable levels of contaminants, so if the athletes are going through drug testing. So being a former athlete and no longer competing, that doesn't mean, you know, even if you're going to take a supplement, you still want to know what you're, you're buying is what, you know, is what's in there. So this is good even if you're not talking about NCAA Division I drug testing. So for someone like Colin, he'd still want to offer his athletes um, or, you know, suggest that they have an NSF certification or um, we'll get to the other one, informed choice. You can probably notice their booth downstairs. 
Um, so I just wanted to give you a snippet as well as the, the resource. All of this can be found online. So if you're curious or you have an athlete that's taking a supplement or brings it to you to, to see um, whether it's NSF certified, all of that's listed. So this is just one snippet of it. You can type in the, uh, the product and see whether it has that certification. But it will also be found on the bottle. Here's the other one, informed choice. So again, uh, they were educating downstairs and they're often at um, the International Society of Sport and Nutrition trying to educate people on what they do and kind of what their certification means as far as products go. So again, another way um, gives assurance, assurance for sport and nutrition products and suppliers as far as one way on good manufacturing processes or, or practices for the facility that's creating the supplement, so we know that it wasn't made in someone's house and sold, right? Um, the processes, the cleanliness, kind of matching the ingredients, um, and then also kind of the same along uh, that what's in the product is listed on the label. So here's another just snippet of that. Um, so one note here before we get into the research, usually if a, a company is paying for their, their products to be certified, it costs a lot of money, which means that they care about um, what you're providing and buying. So it gives you an idea that they care about what's actually in their product is what says it's in their product. So this does give you some idea there too. Um, the other thing that we'll talk about with re research is that more and more, so about 10 years ago, very few companies were spending money on research. Um, now we're seeing more sport nutrition companies buying into that because they want to see if their product is scientifically validated. That being said, if you've ever looked at a sport nutrition article and tried to evaluate some of that literature, it gets a little fuzzy. So um, we're going to try and decipher some of that based on these criteria. So evaluation of er ergogenic aids, um, primarily using scientific evidence. So things to consider, uh, and we'll try and point out the ones that are effective based on synthesizing all this literature. But the sample that's used, are we talking about humans or animals? Is it well controlled? What's meant by well controlled? But well, for example, um, you know, are there any variables that are influencing the, uh, the performance measures or what performance measures are they using? Uh, training status of the athletes. If you're using or trying to incorporate this for a trained athlete and it's done in untrained athletes, that doesn't mean the results are going to be the same. Uh, statistically sig significant, so I'm not sure if you guys came yesterday for Dr. Weir's talk, but oftentimes as scientists we have to report a p-value, um, but we're, what we're also trying to do is, is present individual responses. So for you with your athletes, um, if you know five out of the ten people respond, even though that's not statistically significant, you can evaluate that to see, well, 50% of the people are still improving or you know, negatively influenced. So we also kind of need to look at that. Majority of the data in the research, so you'll see a lot that are positive, a lot that are negative, um, and then published in peer-reviewed journals. So the fact that somebody, or at least usually two people, have evaluated that literature. And then classifying, so what is the goal of the supplement before you can say whether it's positive or negative. And these are the classifications, I won't read them all, but we're going to talk about the apparently effective, um, possibly effective. And what I wanted to mention with this slide is that what we'll see, for example, the first one I'm going to talk about is beta alanine. It's fairly new. Um, you know, it, it, it may change categories. So based on the research, um, you can't just make up your mind on one thing except for something like creatine, right? It's been around for several, several years. Um, but some ingredients and supplements change categories based on what the data shows. Other things to consider, population use, sport specificity, age of the research, is it old, is it new, um, product specific data, so is, if it's a, um, you know, there's some companies spending money on just that specific product. Uh, and then I put this in here because I'm sure you've all tried some sort of supplement and I'll give you my example. Um, so I do a lot of beta alanine work and, and the data, if you take it, there's you know, some anecdotal thoughts or you feel better, so you can't totally discount that. Um, same thing if you have an athlete that thinks it really works. Call it the placebo effect or what it may be, but everyone responds a little bit differently. Okay, so here's what we're going to go through, and I'm just going to talk about beta alanine and hand it off to Dr. Wilborn and then we'll apply some of it. Um, so we'll go through each of these that have strong human research to support use. So again, keeping to human performance related research. 
So what is beta alanine? It's one of the um, kind of hot supplements right now. When I started kind of in this field, um, beta alanine was just coming out. And now we have tons of research. There's a couple meta-analyses. Um, so what is it? It's a non-essential amino acid, uh, the beta form of alanine. And its ultimate role, I think we're getting more educated, but really the goal of taking beta alanine is to increase intramuscular carnosine and therefore enhance muscle buffering capacity. And then this um, essentially buffers hydrogen ions, delays pH, so it could potentially delay um, fatigue. So with that, I'm just going to put this all up here. Um, there's a couple ways we can enhance muscle buffering capacity. If you train hard, do intermittent um, kind of activities, high intensity exercise, that's going to enhance muscle buffering capacity, um, which will increase uh, muscle carnosine naturally. So we can do this naturally. Um, it's going to induce muscle acidosis, just part of an adaptation from training. What beta alanine does, we can consume it through the diet. Um, or we can produce it endogenously. What that will do, it's going to increase um, beta alanine content within the plasma, combine um, or come into the muscle with histidine and form um, greater concentrations of muscle carnosine and therefore enhance intramuscular buffering. So combined, the thought is, is if I take beta alanine with high intensity exercise, that's going to allow me to buffer more hydrogen ions, train at a higher level, Etc. So just a couple basic things here. Ceiling effect, the thing about beta alanine is that no matter where you start or where your uh, carnosine levels are, you can see an increase. So that's different with some supplements. So there is no ceiling effect. So no matter where you start, we can see an increase. Um, time release formula, this has changed over the last five years. So the time release formula is fairly new and used to be only found through uh, NAI. And now lots of different companies use the same um, patent ingredient. So GNC, Power Bar, um, lots of different ones have that. So it's good to know what you're taking because that influences the dose. The one side effect of beta alanine is paresthesia. So a tingling effect. So if you've ever taken it, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and that causes a saturation in the, some central receptor. So it goes away, it peaks about an hour, goes away, and not everyone feels it. So there's no harmful effect of that. As far as performance, just kind of summarize most of the literature, literature here. If you just supplement an individual uh, for that loading phase at four weeks, we see a delay in fatigue, um, short and long sprint performance. Um, total training volume goes up, increased in uh, power output, sprint performance at the end of a ride. So kind of when uh, that pH is challenged. And then if you combine it with exercise, we see a, an even greater increase in carnosine content, increase in training volume, um, which would indirectly lead to an increase in VO2 max due to the training volume, and an increase in lean body mass, again, indirectly due to an increase in training volume. And I'm going to hand it over. Okay, so to, just to say one more thing about beta alanine, if you looked at our first slide where we're talking about how these categories essentially break down, um, and this review was done in, uh, we just redid it. So it's, it, there's a new one that just came out about a year ago, and then we had done it 10 years previous. So we are updating these things as we go, and we plan on doing that every several years, updating if these, if these supplement shift categories like Abby had talked about. One of the things to keep note as we go through these last handful of supplements, and I'm going to show you a list too, and we'll talk about them. Some of those that are they're out there, we may have some positive results on them, but there's just not enough substantial evidence. So there's not 30 studies done on it, or there's not hundreds and hundreds, literally thousands of studies like there have been done on creatine. So some of these have the potential, like beta alanine, as Abby said, the early research going back um, has shown a lot of really positive results. In fact, we just finished a study um, at our lab that showed at an eight-week time point some increases in vertical jump and, uh, and broad jump. Didn't show any changes in body comp and those kind of things, but with eight weeks of testing, and these were normally resistance training people. So there's still a lot of research to come on the area of beta alanine, but so far um, we have seen a lot of positive stuff. Okay, so HMB, most of you guys have heard of HMB. It has been around a long, long, long time. Um, and it's kind of split on whether we should take HMB or not. But just to kind of talk about why it might work, HMB is a metabolite of the essential amino acid leucine. 
We've all, unless you've been living under a rock, heard of leucine. Okay, we know that leucine, that very important amino acid, has the ability to uh, potentially increase skeletal muscle transcript uh, translation. Sorry. So there's some real benefits potentially to leucine by itself. So theoretically, H and B might have some of those similar benefits. Uh, it's found naturally in avocado, citrus fruit, cauliflower, milk, and depending on our uh, our intake, we may be getting about a gram a day. Uh, at the most. So, how does it work? Well, I am not the expert on HMB. That's Jacob Wilson, and he just left, so unfortunately he's not here. But HMB for a long time has been theorized to slow down muscle catabolism. Okay, so as you guys know, we're always in a state of flux. Unfortunately, we're usually in a catabolic state. So as we sit here right now, unless you just worked out at one of the training sessions and had lunch, you're probably catabolic. That's not good. In fact, we spend most of our day in a catabolic state. So theoretically speaking, if HMB could slow down the muscle degradative process, we could in, then essentially hang on to more of what we've got. You all understand how hard it is to gain lean muscle mass. So if there's a way we can slow it down, we would be a fan of that. These are two of the theoretical pathways um, and highlighted in, in Dr. Wilson and others' work. And that is that it slows this pathway here which is just a protein degradative pathway. So essentially it can inhibit this pathway, thus we hold on to more. Now it's also been uh, hypothesized that it also has the ability to affect the mTOR pathway, which is a translational pathway, to increase skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So now some are saying HMB can not only slow down the catabolic process, but increase the synthetic process. So you see where there could be huge benefit there if all of this stuff is true. So what does the research say? And this is where it gets a little bit more confusing. In untrained people, what we find here, six studies in men, three studies in women, um, it, it, they, were, they range, this is kind of a summary, so they range from four to eight weeks. Uh, we see significant de decreases in markers of skeletal muscle breakdown. So in these untrained subjects, these, some of these six studies, show that we actually slow degradation. Okay, that's a good thing, right? But unfortunately, we're not very often working with untrained athletes, are we? I mean, I guess sometimes we are in the early stages. I, at the Division three level, we work with a lot of untrained athletes. They come from high school and have maybe never even been in a weight room. You wouldn't believe how many Division one and Division two in Texas don't even have weight rooms. So they'll come to us and have never lifted a weight. So they may be somewhat untrained. So maybe there's an application there for them. Uh, they also show some significant increases in lean body mass, strength, and training volume. Now, in these women's studies, the female studies, they showed increases in lean body mass and strength. Uh, and then this meta-analysis done in 2003 here showed that at three grams a day, there was an increase in lean body mass and an increase in strength. All right, so far we all love HMB, right? Unfortunately, that's not the case in trained studies uh, as of yet. And there's some new data that just came out um, that, that Jacob talked about yesterday. There were two positive studies, um, a 2004 and a 2000 study, that did show changes in lean body mass in trained people. But those that are split, and, and, and Jacob, who I keep referring to, really this is kind of his area of expertise, he says that this is where it, everyone gets divisive. Because these four studies, two of them were done by my mentor, Dr. Kreider. Okay, so we know they were good studies. They came out of a very reputable lab. It didn't do anything. Okay, so people will point to those studies and these other from Slater and Jack and say, wait a minute, we're split here, so what do we really believe? Well, here's a couple of ideas to think about when we're talking about dealing with athletes. At the Division I level, like where Abby is, and some of you may be, you get to keep athletes year-round. You have a lot of control. I can remember um, when we were at Baylor and working on my doctoral work, we had a... Um, uh, one, of the one of the basketball coaches sent one of our colleagues over to one of the basketball players' houses, told him to empty out his refrig refrigerator, handed him money, said take him shopping and fill his fridge with the right kind of stuff. Okay, that does not happen at the D3 level. Okay, these kids get two meals at the dining hall, which is horrible. So we don't have that kind of control. Where what happens to those kids in the summer? They leave. I work at a private school. It's expensive. They're gone. Okay, so I ask this question, then do my athletes, the ones that we work with, do they train, they do what we ask them to do over the summer? You know they don't, okay? They come back detrained. So that's not the same as untrained, but that is 
in some respects, you go home for three months and don't do a lot, does HMB then have an application there? Okay, I think it does. Here's another one, and Abby, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong here, but um, some of the stuff that Jacob has just done, he's done it in an overreaching model. Okay, so we know what overreaching is. It's just short of overtraining, and overtraining is really, really bad. All right, we like some level of overreaching because that's, that's pushing the, the, our metabolic capacity. In this in a study that he's just done that's unpublished yet, I think they presented some of the data at ISSN a couple months ago or a month ago, <clears throat> It basically shows that in this overreaching model where they're pushed to a real fatigue state, HMB did show some positive benefits, correct? Yep, as well as with an increased stimulus. High, heavy loaded, which these studies don't. Okay, so, oh, hey. That's really loud. Okay, so I just want to make sure y'all are awake. It is the last day late in the afternoon. Uh, so if we increase the exercise intensity, the load that they're doing, and maybe even in these overreaching, these high intensity periods of training, then maybe we have a really good application for HMB. And it's important we said that, that safety was part of all of this discussion. There haven't been any side effects in these studies that have been done, okay, from a clinical perspective. Okay, so caffeine, if, if some of you may have been in here a little bit earlier and heard the talk on caffeine, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, on uh, more time on creatine and protein. So I'll just briefly say with caffeine, if you heard the talk, um, we're kind of split there. There's, we know that caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant, right? We know that. We know that it increases epinephrine and norepinephrine, okay? Norepinephrine and epinephrine in turn then increase our ability to utilize fat or free fatty acids in the blood, right? Okay, so all of that's really, really good. We also know, if we're talking about like body composition and energy expenditure and all of those kind of things, um, we understand that in, in those cases, you're going to see energy expenditure go up when you take caffeine. Okay, typically there's been a lot of studies that have done that. But does it really improve performance? Well, as you heard this morning, some studies are very positive. And some studies just don't show as much benefit. Why it's in this apparently effective category is because we don't, do know it increases energy expenditure. We do know it increases free fatty acids in the blood. From a performance standpoint, though, it's kind of split. And the talk this morning made a couple of points that if you go back and look at the individual responses, what you might find is that there's re responders and non-responders. Okay, so some of us are more caffeine sensitive. It may make us more cognitively aware. It may give us an extra little oomph, a little boost. Um, but the evidence to suggest that it's the be all end all when it comes to sport performance is just not, it's not there. Um, but is caffeine allowed by the NCAA? And that's the question. Right now, it's not, it's banned in certain amounts. Okay, and so we, we get this a lot. It, 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 the division three level, um, we don't have a strength coach, we don't have dietitians, you know, we don't have experts on a lot of this stuff. So they get their information from athletic trainers a lot. Um, and I'll say this because I am an athletic trainer too. Um, our, the evidence you get there comes from text that it's not the focus. It's not sport nutrition text, it's athletic training text. And typically our athletic trainers will say you cannot have caffeine. And the biggest one they talk bad about is Red Bull. Right? They tell them specifically no Red Bull. Red Bull is actually an NSF approved supplement. Okay? It's actually not, you're not going to trigger any tests if your athlete drinks a Red Bull before they go. Now whether you want them to do it or not, that's your decision. But it is not, it's a misconception to say that caffeine and Red Bull, some of these energy drinks, they're going to take it, walk out on the field, get a te drug test, or get a test, and they're going to test positive for too much caffeine by the NCAA guidelines. Okay, that's just not true, and that's another application of NSF, is to put your supplements in there to look, and you can see what's been cleared. Okay, creatine. So, creatine, this kind of like Abby said at the beginning of this talk, this is kind of where this whole idea came up, um, because it is 2012, creatine has been on the market now for 25 years, it's been on the market a long, long, long time. There are thousands of studies that show the efficacy of creatine. Okay, just to give you a background, uh, creatine is, is derived from the amino acids gly glycine, arginine, and methionine. And essentially what it does, it donates a phosphate to ADP to create more ATP. We all know that's energy currency. Um, so theoretically, you take more creatine, you have the ability to create more short-term energy. Okay, so who does that benefit? 
a resistance trained athlete, a sprinter, those kind of people who are doing repeated bout. So how does it benefit us? It gives us a little bit more energy. With a little bit more energy, we can maybe do a little bit more weight or maybe a couple more reps. If we can do those things, then essentially over time that will build upon and build upon and build upon and we'll get stronger and, and so on and so forth. So here's what the research says. These are the reported effects, side of, I mean reported effects. I guess they are side effects, but they're good ones. Increase lean muscle mass, decrease in body fat, increase in maximal strength, power, volume. Um, Darren Willoughby has done a couple studies that showed increase in muscle transcription and translational factors, cell hydration, and it does act as a pH buffer. Okay, so again, you saw that from an NCAA standpoint, is creatine a banned substance? And the answer to that question is no, it's not. I had two of my graduate students, which this was very fitting from a time standpoint, last week um, asked me in class, they said, since when did creatine get banned? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, on our weight room, on our big dry erase board in the weight room, it says, the NCAA has banned creatine. You cannot take it. Really big. The athletic trainers wrote it on the board. Okay? <laughs> I said, well, it's not banned. They can't give it to you. I'm not, I'm not telling you that that's, you, you, you have to give it to them. I'm just saying that's a misconception that's out there, is that it's not banned. As a strength conditioning coach or their position coach or whatever, you can't provide it for them but they can take it. Okay, so then the next question is, um, is it safe? Okay, and we started this whole thing with this question of last year of someone saying, but yes, won't it destroy your kidneys? You know, yes, doesn't cause it muscle cramping and gastrointestinal distress. If you've taken creatine and you got muscle cramping while you were taking creatine, maybe it was the, maybe it was the cause, maybe it was other factors out there, what I can tell you is that in the, the hundreds and hundreds of studies that have been done, that is not a reported side effect. Okay? Most, most of the supplements that are out there, we have very little research on. Okay? A dozen studies, 30 studies, 40 studies. We have hundreds on creatine. And the side effects that are commonly touted, um, our coach, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't mind that I'm talking about him because he knows it, because I've fought him for years on it and I'm not going to win. I'm convinced, but he says you, we cannot give the athletes creatine or encourage them to take it because it will cause cramping and I don't want them to pull muscles. That's his stance. That's, he heard that and he will not believe what I tell him. And the truth is that's just not true. That's not supported by the literature. So uh, just as a way of education here, there are a handful of different creatines out there that you may have seen hit the market. The, the most common is creatine monohydrate. That's been around, that's the one that's been around since early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, it's creatine bound with water. It's 88% creatine. From a research standpoint, it is still the most effective. Okay? Most research has been done on this particular form, and it, and it does appear to be the most effective. Creatine phosphate, which you would think, if we're actually using it for phosphate, would be better than creatine monohydrate. For whatever reason in the literature, it's just not. And you can see that it's actually only 62% creatine. And so... Um, its benefit is just not there compared to uh, good old trusty monohydrate. And the two newer models that you'll see are the creatine citrate. This is creatine bound with citric acid. Um, you've seen this as effervescent creatine. It's actually only 40% creatine. So if you take five grams of it, you're only getting two grams of actual creatine. So it's, again, it's either five grams of the real stuff or you can get, take five grams and only be getting two. And then creatine ester, which the most common is this ethyl ester you've seen. And there's no real research to demonstrate that it has, um, that it's very effective. Okay? I'm not saying that there won't be at some year, some point. But just right now, for the nuts and bolts standpoint, what do you give your athletes, or you don't give it to your athletes, what do you recommend your athletes um, if they're going to take it, they want to take monohydrate? Okay, so protein and amino acids is another very, very hot sometimes controversial topic. We heard a lot of great talks. If you heard uh, uh, Jeff Volek's talk this, this morning, it was awesome about um, uh, not necessarily more protein, but more of a ketogenic diet and lo lower carbohydrate diet. We know we need protein, and here's why we need protein. If you, if you gathered anything from that talk, and if you weren't here, I'll, I'll tell you. Essentially, we don't store protein in the body. Well, we kind of do, in the form of skeletal muscle. But if you need protein to build something, do you want to get it from your skeletal muscle? I don't. 
Okay, so we kind of have what we call a, it's an amino acid pool. It's a transient pool of amino acids we can draw from. All right, the only other place we get protein is from our diet. So the essential amino acids that we have to have to create new proteins, and, cre and, and proteins are not just skeletal muscle. Okay, it's hair, it's nails, it's skin, it's hormones, pretty important hormones, right? Uh, it's red blood cells. All of these things are made up of these amino acids. And if we're not getting them in our diet, where are we getting them from? Okay, if we have to have them, maybe we're breaking down skeletal muscle. Well, that's not good. We don't want that. So this is the recommendation, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. It's been there for a long, long time. It is a recommendation that was made based on a sedentary population. Okay, you've heard this before. We are not a sedentary population. Do we need more than 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight? And the answer is yes. The research supports the fact that we need more Athletes, and, and, I'm, and believe me, my activity of 45 minutes or an hour a day, you know, five or six days a week, is nothing like an athlete, a collegiate athlete training two or three hours a day. All right, so now they're oxidizing amino acids at a rapid rate. What do we have to do? We've got to replace that with dietary amino acids or protein so that they can get into an anabolic. I told you we were catabolic unless we had food. Okay, so they need to get in that anabolic side of the, the bar, and the only way to do that well, calories, but additional protein. So does the research support it? Yes. I won't insult your intelligence and read all these to you, but years in work out of, of Wolf's lab and others have shown that when we take in amino acids or protein, we increase protein synthesis. To build muscle, we have to be in a positive protein balance. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It doesn't matter how hard you train. It doesn't matter how hard you train. You can train harder and harder and harder and harder. If you don't have the protein there to create new skeletal muscle, it cannot happen. It's physiologically impossible. So again, these are just more uh, recommendations. Um, essentially, what we're going to be looking at from a grams per kilogram of body weight standpoint is somewhere between 1.2 and 2 grams a day. Okay, And that can vary depending on the athlete. Uh, depending on uh, the amount of time that they actually exercise, the rigor of the exercise, all those things come into play. So now the question about protein is, <clears throat> is it safe? If you heard Dr. Crowder's talk uh, yesterday, I think, um, he talked about the, the, the over 1,500 women that he's put on the Curves diet, which is higher protein and a little bit lower carbohydrate. We're not talking about five, 600 grams of protein a day, y'all. Okay, we're just talking about bringing them up to where it's about 30% of their diet, maybe 35%. In some cases, it was as high as 40, but generally between 30 and 40%, somewhere in there. Is that, did that show to be harmful in all of those studies? The answer is no, it didn't. And there's a lot of other studies that have been out there for a long time. This is just another misnomer in the research that have, that, that have done this and looked at kidney function. That's the complaint, right? Well, but too much protein will destroy your kidneys. It's not true. It has not been shown in the literature at 30 to 40 percent of total macronutrient intake to be harmful to the kidneys. Okay. Okay. Another one is sodium bicarb. Again, something that's been around a long, long, long time. Uh, the the purpose of this or the benefit can essentially is to reduce the pH, right? So reduce the acidity by taking sodium bicarbonate. It could delay fatigue, impair recovery, and actually the research is very supportive. I know I, this seems like an old supplement, right? Uh, been around for a long, long time, but surprisingly it works. Here's the trouble with it. To actually take it in beneficial, beneficial dosages, it's an enormous amount of sodium bicarb. It's about uh, three to 500 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, okay? So when you take that much sodium bicarbonate, essentially what happens is it is associated with these other problems here. So now you can cycle a little bit longer, but you're going to have diarrhea. So it may offset your desire to, uh, uh, to take sodium bicarb. Now, it falls under this category because the research is supportive. Okay? Unfortunately, it's just at very, very, very high dosages most of the time. So it may not be as practical, even though it is effective. Okay, and then the last one here is uh, sodium citrate. And like sodium bicarbonate, citrate can reduce blood acidity. Um, again, this particular supplement um, has shown some benefit um, between 2 and 15 minutes. But, so it's shown some benefit in high-intensity exercise. 
that also falls in line with beta alanine and creatine. Okay, so typically what I think has happened is that we found creatine to be so effective and safe and um, beta alanine now with a lot of positive evidence that we just don't use it quite as much um, in this population in this anaer anaerobically trained pop. Okay, so that's my, my guess is why, because you just don't hear about sodium citrate must, even though in our position stand it did, uh, the research did pan out where it is, uh, where it's beneficial. Okay, so I'll take a breath, I know I'll talk fast. Let me uh, show you this, some of this, and then we're going to let Abby show, talk to us about some um, general applications for endurance athletes, and I'll talk about strength athletes. Here is where some of the stuff that you've heard, and this may be where some of the questions come up. Okay, we've heard about the benefit of, uh, of alpha ketoglutarate, right? Okay, with like NO2 products and those things been around for a while, get you a good muscle pump. Evidence does not support their use. Okay, does it mean that someday it won't be wonderful? Because I will tell you in truth, there's only been a handful of studies. Okay, we did one of them at Baylor, but there's only been a handful. So, I mean, 10 years from now, it may be the best supplement ever. But in reality, um, it just hasn't shown to be beneficial from, the, from a research standpoint. Um, alpha ketoacicaproate, I can't say that, kick. And that was real big a few years ago with a bunch of supplements for a couple of uh, sports supplement companies. Alpha uh, lipoic acid, uh, BCAAs. Okay, and that's kind of funny because we know that there is, um, we, I showed you the benefit of amino acids, um, of essential amino acids. This is one that I truly believe will we'll move up. It needs to be in that other category because there's a lot of evidence to show that BCAA, specifically leucine, has some real positive benefits. So this is one that, like Abby told you, this is one that will probably get bumped up. Colostrum, DHEA has never been shown to be beneficial. Um, GABA, ginseng, glycerol, N-acetylcysteine, uh, ribose, taurine. Okay, so these are all names that you recognize. And again, Understand me, I'm not saying they're not beneficial. I'm just telling you the research doesn't support their use. And when you've got to make some, de some, some decisions on what you're going to recommend to people that ask you because you know they do, why not stick with what works? And that's what uh, we shared with you already. All right, so this is limited to no human research. Um, uh, you can see these ATP, betaine, choline, chromium, and I'm thinking I've just seen some studies on these recently, still not much, CLA, um, is another popular, I got a, a text message yesterday from a student that uh, a friend of hers was about to buy some CLA. She said, Dr. Wilm, what do you think about CLA? And I said, you know what? There's been a couple studies show positive. There have been several studies that show it didn't do anything at all. And that's why it falls into this category. d pentatol we did a story on pentatol. Um, ectosterones, also published a study on ectosterones that didn't show any benefit. Uh, what about glutamine? Okay, we hear about glutamine all of the time. And we don't have enough time to get it deep into glutamine but theoretically, it could be the best supplement that ever existed. All right, most abundant amino acid in skeletal muscle, it's involved in immunity, all these things. There's no evidence in the literature. There's one good study that shows that glutamine may be beneficial. Everything else, glutamine does not work according to the research that's been done. And there's actually been a lot of research on glutamine. HCA used to be in supplements. It's not around much anymore. Uh, pyruvate, tribulus, tyrosine, yohimbine, you've seen some of these names, okay? Okay, so one more thing here, and then I'm going to uh, turn it back over to, to Abby, and, and that is, these are what are reported, okay? So this is the most common supplements that strength and power athletes take, chromium, creatine, conjugated linoleic acid, so CLA. So again, I just told you, how, what do you take from this? These are what your athletes are saying that they most commonly take, okay? We know there's no evidence to, to have them keep taking CLA. Now, things like uh, other fish oils, okay, are very, very important. We know there's a lot of good research coming out about that. Medium chain triglycerides, um, there's HMB, protein bars, protein powders, okay? So from this, you can take that these two items, the creatine and the protein, these are the things that are probably the most beneficial. They've got the most bang for their buck, but unfortunately, you can't hand those to your athletes, okay? So to be clear on NCAA rules, they can take them. They're not going to test positive for anything. They're not going to get any trouble. They are beneficial. They are safe. You just cannot provide them uh, access to those things, okay?
There, yeah, there, so just for endurance, we just wanted to, um, on this next slide, we just wanted to talk about um, kind of what we would give and what reported um, common intakes for athletes in these different categories. So um, the reason I got stuck with endurance athletes at a strength coach is because I was an endurance athlete and I didn't take any supplements um, because I didn't know anything about it. So this is what's reported generally, the energy gels, the carbohydrates, when um, we know based on the research that essential amino acids should be taken in these athletes. Um, there's research with branch chains in endurance athletes as far as central fatigue. Um, and then some of the, the other things, caffeine here comes out again, right? And notice that um, the beta alanine is coming into play. And the big question, so I read, wrote a paper on uh, creatine intake for not only endurance, but female endurance athletes, which is a huge no-no, right? I'm going to gain weight and I'm not going to be run, be, I'm going to be heavy and not be able to run as fast. But what we're finding is that it, there is no detrimental effect on, on endurance performance um, and in fact may improve recovery. So there's a lot of transfer there. So um, based on what I would say, if an endurance athlete came to me and said, what supplement should you take, being that the diet was in place. Um, I mean, the biggest ones would be a low dose of creatine, potentially beta alanine, um, fish oil, and your essential amino acids. Uh, so when you look at all of this, a lot of the other stuff you don't need, and it's not supported by research. If we go back one and talk about strength power athletes, and I, don't, I mean, I don't necessarily need to put it up here, but when we say what supplements should be used by strength power athletes showed by research, I don't know, Colin, what you would say, but a lot of them would be the same for endurance athlete. We would see creatine, we would see fish oil, we would see beta alanine, um, and our protein, our essential amino acid. So based on the literature, a lot of what they should be taking and what would be effective cannot be provided by the NCAA. So a lot of athletes take that as they can't, they can't consume it. So I get a lot of people saying, you know, well, my sports nutritionist told me not to take any supplements. So then they go sneak around and buy ones that they shouldn't take or waste their money. Um, you know, so tell them which ones are effective, worth their money, not the non, you know, combined ingredients. Sometimes the simple ones are the best and most effective. And we wanted to leave some time for questions so that if you guys have any specific questions um, related to any of these, because uh, we just gave a general overview, we'd be happy to answer those or apply maybe your current setting. Yeah, let me say let me say this about hormone affecting supplements. Okay, like IGF, we have these GH type products. We have uh, aroma, yeah, testosterone boosters, aromatase inhibitors, all of these kind of things. Okay, um, the literature, even Andrstein Down, y'all remember that? That's why uh, Mark McGuire got so big, right? Okay, so Andrstein Down back in the day, research didn't support that. Okay, now you may know people that showed that you know, said, ah, oh, I took an andro and it's wonderful and I'm getting huge. The research didn't support it. Overwhelmingly, research does not support the pro-hormone because it doesn't do, for example, androstene dione is what, one carbon molecule away from being testosterone. Theoretically, you take it, surely you're going to find that carbon molecule somewhere and convert it to testosterone. Doesn't happen. Aromatase inhibitors, which uh, myself and, and, and Dr. Lem Taylor, we've done a lot of work on aromatase inhibitors. In fact, we have a lot of published studies on aromatase inhibitors. And some of them boost testosterone, some of them don't. 
Okay, but here's the thing. You can boost testosterone. If you don't boost androgen receptors too, it doesn't do anything. Okay, so even though we may see a little boost in testosterone, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to translate into massive changes in, in lean mass skeletal muscle. So um, I would typically stay away from those type of products. One, they're expensive. And two, there's no evidence to suggest they will actually do what they're supposed to do. Mm hmm You know, that's a tough question. Um, I, I don't know what is going forth, and the trick is, uh, so we're PhDs and not RDs, and generally that's who makes the recommendation, and training is very different. So I believe there are some bylaws, but um, it's hard to change laws once they're in there. So I don't know. The bylaws that were added recently were they can now provide fruits, nuts, and bagels which, again, is more carbohydrate and less amino acids. So I think that, you know, that's something to look into as far as what we can provide. But right now, this is, uh, if you've noticed over the past week, there's more nutrition talks here than there has been in the last three years. So this is our chance to educate strength coaches on what they can provide and educate their athletes with. Sir. Endurance cycling? No, cycling. Let me. Oh, cycling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, here's what we Word. found. Okay, in a little quick study we did, um, you take creatine five grams first day, keep taking it every day. Every day thereafter, more and more and more urinary creatinine is excreted. Okay, what that shows is that there is creatine saturation. So to to, to end the argument, absolutely, cycle on and off. Once creatine sat, once creatine stores are saturated, you're getting no additional benefit. Now, does it, is it harmful to stay on? No, but really you're just wasting it. And in fact, the three to five grams is good. And I like that you said that because we know for most people like my size, I don't need five grams a day. Um, I just probably need three grams a day. You know, we got five in our head. And the other thing, a quick point, you don't need to load. Okay, there's no reason to load creatine. It's just a way to spend more money. You just need that three to five grams a day, um, you know, 60 days, 90 days, something, get off for a little bit, get back on. And let me just add, I would say not to cycle as far as non-performance ways. So there's a lot of literature coming out uh, as far as central effect of creatine supplementation, enhancing your uh, uh, neuromuscular stores, um, as well as bone health. So a low dose of creatine every day is what I would suggest, especially how cheap it is. So to cycle, maybe you'll you know excrete a little bit, but it's not like you know, three to five grams, it's not a whole lot that you're excreting. One last question then. If you have athletes worried about potentially having urinary tests, excreting more creatine in their urine at a time effect on that? No. No. Thank you very much. And just to add, you mentioned this, um, but I didn't get to point out, there's a new um, review paper that uh, myself and a colleague put together as far as what creatine does to cell hydration. I still get lots of athletes say that it, I'm going to cramp and it's going to cause muscle, you know, dehydration. It actually draws more water into the cell and maintains hydration. So if you are training somebody in hot heat that's going to sweat, creatine actually can prevent some of that dehydration. And to that end, the special forces are now, in some cases, experimenting giving their special forces, the United States special forces, creatine to prevent heat illness mm -hmm. when they're out in the field. Okay, so that's completely opposite of what people have been saying and still were saying last year at this conference. New York Times that, pu published an article that said that it caused dehydration. Yeah, that it causes dehydration. When in fact our, the, our elite fighting forces are now taking it to prevent dehydration because of exactly what Abby said. Mm -hmm.
This is based on the position statement, um, and it's based on human data to support use and exercise performance. So we could go all day and talk about different uses for a lot of these, so strictly related to exercise. Okay, thank you very thank much. You.